I'm Gwyneth Jones of the Translator Studio. We specialise in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for professional exams like the Diptrans. In this video, I interview Suzanne Stevens, a Spanish to English translator with over 30 years experience working in academia and the arts, and a recent student of ours. Suzanne talks about her life as a translator and how becoming a translator was a vocation for her from an early age. She tells me about moving to Mexico and working as an English teacher before transitioning into translation after having children. She discusses her initial experience working in-house for translation agencies before she moved across to freelancing. She talks about figuring out her specialisations, the perils of biting off more than you can chew, and the importance of networking and quality translations as ways to ensure ongoing work. Translators, I give you Suzanne Stevens. Suzanne, tell us the story of how you became a professional translator. Well, it probably all started when I was about 15 because I did uh, French and Spanish for A-level. And I remember looking at translations of Balzac and being pretty underwhelmed. And although I couldn't have translated 19th century French at the time, I thought if I ever became a translator, hopefully I'd do a much better job um, that, than, than these translators have, have done, even though it was for A-level students. And then when I was at the end of um, sixth form, the careers department in, invited all of the people who were doing languages to, or they rather invited experts, outside experts, to tell us what we could do with languages. And I remember one woman came in and she was an English teacher. And she said, to be an English teacher, you have to be a real extrovert because you have to walk in uh, to a, a group of 30 students who don't speak a word and you have to do acting and role play and stuff. And I thought, oh gosh, that sounds terrible. And then of course I ended up teaching for 10 years. And then there was another woman who was um, married to a Spaniard and she translated into Spanish. And she told us about the job and it sounded fascinating. And I, and I thought, yes, I'd love to do that. And she said, there is one problem. Of every 100 people who say they want to become a translator, only one person actually becomes a translator. And I wanted to say, I'm the one. I'm the one in 100. And I was so shy. I couldn't even bring myself to get up off the chair and go and cross the room. But I think I knew then that that's what I really wanted to, to become. And then uh, I did Spanish and Catalan and Portuguese and French at, at university. And then I came, came to Mexico. And of course, <laughs> I, I came on an exchange and, and the job we were given was to be an English teacher. So I, mm -hmm. I taught English despite myself for, for 10 years. <laughs> and then after, and in the, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, I got married and I had two children. And when my second child was born, I realized it was, as you know, teaching is quite physically tiring. Yes. And, and looking after two children after and under the age of three is also tiring. So I have to make a career change. So I started translating um, two days a week and went on teaching for three days. And then after six months, I changed the balance to three days translation to two days teaching. And then after a year, I was fortunately able to give up uh, teaching forever. Well, certainly for full time teaching. And I became a full time translator. And at the beginning, um, because you always think these things are going to be easier than they are. I worked for two agencies. One was run by an American man and the other by a Mexican woman. And I worked for them for two years and I covered, covered a huge variety of topics. And during those two years, I realized what I enjoyed and what I didn't. And after two years, I thought, I think I can do this on my own. And I did. And, so and in, in the first two years, they were actually employing you like yes. you were going to the office. What um what year are we talking about here, Suzanne? This is before internet, so this would have been a, a very different. It, even the way that you transitioned into translation is very similar to how I transitioned in going from English yeah. teaching. But mm -hmm. of course, for me, it was online profile, get the CV out, email a hundred agencies. What what was ah, what was it well, like it, for you when you started? You you you. That's an interesting question. It was ninety one. Mm -hmm. And that was, fortunately uh, for me, that was the year that, that 
computers arrived in Mexico. So at least I didn't have to use a typewriter. And I started using a modem about two or three months later, but I had to, I had to drive a lot um, to pick up the translations. And there were things you may, may not have seen them, you know, floppy disks and things. Mm -hmm. So people, I would pick up the translation, pop it in the computer and then print it out and, and translate. And then, uh, you know, I, I obviously don't print things out anymore, but that's what, that's how it started. I think I was always, I think it was very fortunate that even though I'd been thinking about translation for a couple of years before I actually took the plunge, I actually did it when computers were, were widely available and affordable and so on. And how would the feedback process work with the client then? Because it, it would have been a longer process for transferring your translation. And then if there was feedback and corrections, I guess it would have, everything would have taken longer. I didn't get much feedback because I worked for these two people. Mm -hmm. And I think they must have edited my, my translations and any feedback they got. Um, I mean, I only occasionally got feedback, either if it was very good or, or, or not very good. But I, I, didn't get very, I didn't get very much feedback. And I presumed that it was good because they kept on employing me, you know, for... It's years. interesting because you might say, oh, yeah, nowadays with Internet, you get loads of feedback. But actually, translators continue to complain that their clients don't give them very much in the way of feedback. So it doesn't seem that the Internet has really resolved that. No, it, and I think I, you usually only get feedback if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And if it's fine, people tend not to say. They just say, OK, fine. And occasionally they say, oh, that was, you know, that was wonderful. But mm -hmm. I still get, you know, very, very little feedback. But, but, but the, the feedback I, I get is that people continue to send me work. Yes, no news is good news, as my father yes. always says, and, and on, yep. on to the next project. Yes, and exactly. so, so we're going back, I mean, that was 20, well, no, we're going back nearly 30 years ago now. Yep. And so, can you, I mean, I know it's a lot of years. Can you give us, so you started out as a freelancer and what did your career look like? I know it's a, a lot of time. I believe you worked for universities and things like that. Yes, it, I haven't. My, as I told you, as I said, um, when I did all the covered all these subjects, mm -hmm. I realized there were certain things I really didn't like. For example, like like law mm -hmm. or or commerce, and I studied literature, so I rarely touched science. And that once once I, that, that's another interesting question. Once I I was became a, a freelancer. I decided that I would only ever take, accept jobs that I was interested in, which was quite bold, considering I didn't have a portfolio of, of clients at all. But I thought if I'm going to spend eight hours a day or six hours doing something, I'd like it to be something pleasurable and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And, and the advantage of that was that if you do something good on art history, the art historian recommends you to all her friends. And so you get a lot more work on on art history. So so I, I did that, and I, and I just built up my client base. I must have like about sixty five clients now, and some of them I've had for thirty years, and they just recommend you to one or two friends, or sometimes as they get older to their children or their children's friends. So it's all it's all basically word of mouth. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, and. Um... What if sort of talking in general for someone who might be thinking of becoming a translator, what does a day in the life of a working translator look like from where you're sitting? <laughs> well, it's it's actually pretty um, uneventful. Um, I've, I've realized it, it, because it's such a, a solitary pursuit and, and you're you're in your chair all day. It's really important to do exercise. So I um, trot off to the gym in the morning, come back, have breakfast check my emails, and then usually get on with the translation that I've already started. Another thing I do in addition to translation is proofreading. And I find it's much easier for me to proofread in the morning because I, you're, you're fresher and, and the light's better. So, and I find it's much easier to pick up mistakes. So if I have any proofreading jobs, I do them in the morning and then I just sort of work through until the evening. So it, it's, fairly, it's a fairly uneventful process. <laughs> sit down you know and translate it is true using that morning brain juice try it to do the more difficult problems I sometimes do that if I've got if I've got a difficult text or something that's just not clicking or I can't find the answer I'll just write it it's four or five o'clock in the afternoon 
I'll just write it off till the next morning. And then I find once I've slept, even though I haven't thought about it, you just start and suddenly in the morning it comes to you and, and off you go. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Can you tell us about a bad experience related to your work that has made you better at what you do? Yes. Once, once upon a time, I was given a, a book about um, to do and had about 14 chapters and it was about the the status of a particular discipline in Mexico and I had about three months to do it which was fine and then in the middle somebody asked me to be an interpreter for a South African ballet company and I thought oh that sounds fun and I sort of envisaged I would be with them for about a couple of hours a day but none of them spoke Spanish at all and they had lots of problems so I ended up spending all day, every day with them for about two weeks, and which was great fun. But when they left, I was really behind with my translation and I was rushing and then I'd, I'd taken on something else as well. And so, and it, so I was really racing against the clock. And when I handed it in, obviously it wasn't a great piece of work. And, and most of the chapters were okay. I think there were about 14. And, and the, the author of one of them said, this is unacceptable. I'm not having my name on it and so on. So I said to, to I said to my client, okay, um, I won't charge you for that that chapter. And the money that I did gave back was exactly the same amount as I'd been paid by the South American a South African ballet dancer. So I thought, okay, that was a disastrous decision. You know, I mean, it was really fun to, to be an interpreter, but it was financially it wasn't beneficial, and it took me months. To regain my client's confidence because she'd always sent me things you know and known that they'd come back well done and I, I was very embarrassed and I thought I will never bite off more than I can chew again. It is sometimes you've got to have that bad experience to learn from it haven't you I hope someone could listen yeah. to your story and go I've, le I've learned from that now and I will never bite off more than I could chew but then <laughs> that, that idea where you just said yes Yes, yes. And then you think, oh, I've said yes four times this morning. And you suddenly look at how much time there's left in, in the week. And so I know I know the feeling. Yes, that, that's, there's a fine line between sort of having enough and too much. Mm. And I find that what, one thing I've learned in the past 30 years is it's always good to leave a slight gap. Because you, you see, something will always come in at midnight and somebody will say, okay, I need this for tomorrow because I have to apply for a doctorate or or... Or something so it's always good to have you know it's, it's a bit like you know petrol in the tank not yes. not to use up all your time stay at sort of 80 percent max unless there's something very yeah. urgent or very important and also yeah. i think just in the long term for your own sustainability and health you can't be stressing every day oh i've got a deadline in two hours you can't every day be working that way it's okay once in a while but it it's yeah. very wearing if you do it for too long yeah it's, and it's, it's extremely worrying Yes. And as you, as you said at the beginning, I mean, do subjects you enjoy and also making sure that you're enjoying your work. If you're getting to a point where you're worn down by it and losing money and getting customer complaints, then it's definitely a sign to yeah slow it down. It's certainly yeah. I can I can I share that experience from the past. Mm -hmm. I've got better at it as I've got yeah. older and more experienced. And thinking about upcoming translators who might be watching this this interview, two of the main concerns that I hear from people are that they're worried whether there's going to be enough work for them once they qualify, and they're worried about the impact that machine translation might be going to have on the future of translators. And I wanted to ask you if you've got any comments on one or both of those, those issues. Yes, definitely. It, it's always, you're always worried about not enough work coming in, and then sometimes you, you're offered something, and then at the last moment somebody says, Okay, it's already been done. We don't need it, and and that's that's a sort of occupational hazard. And I find just it, provided you you hand in consistently good work, people you'll you'll get more work. So you're you're you're, you're your own best um, agent. So you have to really focus on every translation. Is that the only translation in the world? <clears throat> and almost as though your your life depended on that. And I find that that brings in more work. And and the other thing is I I find that I Wherever I go, people always, maybe because this is Mexico, but I, people always need translations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's quite in you sort of at the gym or even at a funeral once. I was offered a translation at a funeral once. I was really oh, surprised about. Um, so, so work just, just, just tends to come in. 
you know, as long as people, you don't have to, I think you don't have to um, promote yourself aggressively, but if your friends and acquaintances know that you translate, they'll tend to, to give you work. So I've never had a touch wood, never had a problem of, of not having enough work. And the other thing you said about machine translation, I remember when I started off 31 years ago, I went to a children's birthday party and there was a software engineer there. And I told him, I was thinking of going to translation. He said, you realize you'll be out of work in two years, don't you? <laughs> and I said, you know, because of machine translation. And, and I said, well, I don't think so. Well, th- you know, thank you for that. But I don't think so because, you know, even however good a machine translation is, you always need the human element. And one of my friends said that she'd, she'd been given a, a machine translation thing and she put in um, the, the English phrase that she put in was a glass of water and the machine translation that popped up was un vidrio de agua, which, which, um, which is like, you know, a pane of glass. Yeah, like a yeah. window of water or something yes, like, like that. Yes, like a window of water. So I, I, I told the guy that and he um, I wasn't very pleased. But I mean, that, that, that's... <laughs> he started it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it actually is a lot of people that don't know anything about translation who find it necessary at a children's party to warn you that you're going to be out yes. of work shortly. Um, yes. It, it's actually what you said there reminded me of, of the a, t- a talk I did a few years ago on, on machine translation on the situation it was in. And there I did, I quoted, it was a quote from the 50s with the very, very first machine translation that was being developed. I think it was in the States. And Mm -hmm. then in the 50s, they'd also said that within five years, they would have, they would have that down. There would be no need for human translators anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, A very, very optimistic area is (laughs) development of machine (laughs) translation. So, you know, even though machine translations come a long way in 30 years, yes. it's not its not a problem. It's yeah. not a problem. It's, I mean, it's certainly growing and it's a tool and you can like it or not. You've got to be, you've, you've got to be open to it. But from what I'm, I, I agree with you, from what I'm seeing, I'm, I don't think it's going to suddenly put us all out of work anytime soon. No, no. Because a big, a big part of translation is interpretation. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and also, it, it depends how, how well a text is written, you know, and, and if a text is badly written as a translation, you have to edit and translate at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I, I doubt a machine would be able to do that. To finish up this interview, I wanted to ask you, do you have a message for upcoming translators? Yes, I think if you, if you like languages, and especially if you like words, it, it, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful profession. So, you know, I would say if you're thinking about translation, go for it, give it a try, see how you feel after a year and, and, and you'll either love it or loathe it. <laughs> very good. A good bit of advice there. Have a go. <laughs> Thank you very much for speaking to me, Suzanne. It's been really interesting to hear about your career. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this interview from the Translators Studio. We specialise in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for certification through the DipTrans exam. If you like our content, please let us know by clicking on the subscribe button. See you in the next video.